trying to get in on that chain. Hello. That's good. Just right. speak into this, but don't use it. Hello. Hello. All right, can everybody hear me? Awesome. Okay, so since we're kind of running behind, we'll try to speed it up for you guys. Um, I'm Andrew Mara, and these are my colleagues, Tina Hasino and Louis Roncaglione. So some patient background information. Uh, our patient's 51 years old. She's a female from Charleston, West Virginia. She's among five spectacular boys and works for her husband's law office. Um, she loves to read and cook, and she regularly enjoys a glass of wine to help cope with the five beautiful boys. Um, some medical history, her average blood pressure was 121 or 78 with a pulse of 72. And uh, she was diagnosed with a mitral valve prolapse during her second pregnancy, but she's currently not being treated for that. Um, she's on no medications, no known allergies, non-smoker, and uh, consumes alcohol two or three times per week. And she's an ASA2 patient. All right, so her chief complaint was my front, to, my front crown is broken. Um, dental history, she did want to change the appearance of her teeth. Um, it would upset her to lose her teeth and wear dentures. And she has been seen regularly by a private dentist for her entire life. And then some previous treatment, uh, she has regular preventive care. Um, she has multiple amalgam and composite restorations, thermal extractions, crowns, and root canal therapy. Uh, she did have trauma to her maxillary central incisors around 30 years ago. And um, it upsets her because she tries to take good care of her teeth, but she still has food that gets caught between her teeth. And um, she regularly flosses, but her gums bleed. So she wants to try to get that taken care of. Some oral habits, uh, she brushes and flosses daily, uses Colgate toothpaste, um, Listerine mouthwash. Um, she tends to grind her teeth at night, she claimed, and uh, drinks fluoridated water. All right, so for the orofacial exam, uh, we found generalized moderate gingival inflammation, uh, localized areas of plaque and calculus buildup, and she had some extrinsic staining and attrition and then her molar classification was a class one bilaterally. And then for her caries risk assessment, uh, her risk factors and her protective factors actually equaled out. So we um, went ahead and diagnosed her with caries risk of moderate. And that involved bite wings every 18 to 24 months, uh, recalls every four to six months, and the saliva test at the initial exam and then we also recommended um, two pieces of gum or two candies, xylitol four times per day, and then uh, fluoride toothpaste two times per day and fluoride varnish as needed. So this is our frontal view. Uh, this is our right side. And this is the left side. And then, yeah, sorry for the some of the pictures. Uh, this is the maxillary, maxillary arch and then um, the mandibular arch. And you can see she has multiple uh, 
large restorations and crowns in both arches on her posterior. And now I will pass it off to Keenan Hasino to go through the uh, treatment plan cons treatment planning consults. I think my hands are too wet to get this on. Just bear with me. Andrew, I think I'm gonna need your help, man. <laughs> All right, cool, cool. Hello everyone, my name is Kenan. So this is the perio consult. Um, etiology is plaque and local contrib contributory factors, which would be caries, um, symptoms, gingival inflammation, bleeding on probing. Her PSRs were good. She didn't need um, full mouth charting and the diagnosis is plaque-induced gingivitis, and the prognosis is favorable with adult prophy, OHI, and fluoride varnish. This is the uh, pano, and there's a little, it's mostly unremarkable, but there's a little bit of cloudiness in the sinuses, and there's a little condensing osteitis on number 18. For the operative consult, there's defective restorations on many teeth, as you can see, um, clinical caries as well, and radiographic caries, four distal, seven mesial, eight mesial, 10 mesial, 10 distal, 19 mesial. Um, diagnosis is dental caries as well as recurrent dental caries, and it's fair with restorative treatment. Um, patient doesn't wish to lose any teeth, so if a root canal is needed, she's going to get it done. So these are the right side radiographs. Um, I'm going to get back to number four in a different PowerPoint. Uh, number seven, you can see some mesial caries. On uh, number three, on the distal, there's defective margin, also on the mesial, and then on the distal of number four, there's caries as well as a defective margin. Okay, for the left side, um, number 10 on the mesial, there's recurrent decay as well as the defective margin. And then on the distal, there's caries as well. And then tooth number 18, there's a defective margin. Um, Actually, the crown kind of came off and the patient swallowed it. Um, I'm not sure when exactly that happened, but it did happen sometime. And then on number 19, there's mesial caries as well as a defective margin. These are the anterior radiographs now. So for tooth number eight, there's mesial caries. And on number nine, there's mesial, um, mesial defective margin, and then on the crown, and then on number 10, you can see mesial caries as well as a defective margin. So the fixed pros consult um, problem, a lot of defective restorations and dental caries, the diagnosis is the same, and the prognosis is fair with cores and crowns on three, eight, nine, 18, 19, 20, 29, 30, and 31. And so now going to number four, um, let me just go back to that in another PowerPoint actually. Okay, so for the removable consult, patient grinds her teeth at night, so a night guard, which is really good, it'll help you get one unit of uh, removable. It's really good to do on someone. As for the endo consult, um, patients had many previous root canals um, and, well, okay, so number four, um, it had like previous root canal therapy done on it. Um, however, the patient's asymptomatic. Um, it's not bothering her at all. And um, let me just go to here. Okay, so. 
This is number four. It had endo done a while back. Um, there is some apical scarring. However, the patient doesn't have any symptoms or pain. So the root canal may be good. Um, this could just be like an area of less dense bone. Um, so the tooth may or may not need uh, treatment or retreatment. So basically the patient uh, said that she'll just keep an eye on it and if it starts bothering her, she'll get work done on it. Okay, treatment planning time. Okay, so this is the preliminary PROS review. Um, wax up of number 18 was done because the crown came off sometime. And this is some nice hand articulation for you. Hope you guys can appreciate it. And now for treatment option number one, uh, for phase one and two, no treatment. For phase three, adult prophy, nutritional counseling, OHI, fluoride, and number two, MO composite, uh, three, composite core, five, DO composite, number seven, mesolingual composite, um, eight and nine, composite cores, and then number 10, uh, distolingual, as well as mesolingual composite, number 11, distolingual composite, number 12, DO composite. <laughs> I think you guys can, um, finish reading or reading the rest of it. And now I'll go to the phase four treatment, which is a, a very ambitious phase. Um, this is a great patient to graduate on. There's many, many crowns uh, to get done. These are all ceramic crowns. Um, and here's the option number two. This option is much more favorable um, because so 20 and 29 are now amalgams. That will really help you get your uh, amalgam WVUs. And um, the onlays, those are awesome because you can get amalgam WVUs as well as one fixed WVU. So this is uh, much more favorable for the student. And treatment option three is going to be no treatment. <laughs> now I'm going to pass it on to Lewis, guys. <laughs> Okay. Did I just click? Okay, so our patient chose treatment option number two. Um, and the reason why she chose treatment option number two was because she'd exhibited uh, a lot of wear on her existing restorations, and a lot of these restorations that are currently in her mouth have, are like the second and third go at these restorations, and she's kind of sick of having to replace them every like five or 10 years. And so we decided to do a little bit of research and decided that for those two teeth, for the cores that had specifically exhibited the most, um, most wear, but not so much disease or caries, first we wanted to know which we wanted to use in terms of amalgam or composite. And so based on this systematic review and meta-analysis that was done in 2015, it was determined that if you aren't a high risk patient for caries, then there's really no difference in the longevity at five and 10 years. And so with aesthetics being a, a very big emphasis from the patient, we decided to go with composite. Um, in doing the cores, do, during the core preparation for number 30, um, the Preparation ended up being much bigger than we thought it would be based on the pre-op radiograph. And the patient was informed that she may have potential sensitivity and after the restoration was completed, but no blushing was observed, and we used a Theracal liner just in case. Um, however, afterwards, after about a week of the core being placed, the patient noticed a little bit of sensitivity starting, and we brought her back and reduced the occlusion on the restoration and gave it another week, and at first it helped, but then after about three or four days, it came back and just slowly progressed in intensity. And so that's when we decided to go ahead and do a prophylactic root canal. Um, so here is the initial instrumentation of the 
root canal on number 30. Here's the final PA of the operation and core here. And now here is the right side after completion of phase three. And here's the left side after completion of phase three. But it is important to note that this patient was multiple people's boards patients, so all the anterior restorations were put off until after the board exam. So all the posterior stuff, which is pretty much the case itself with being the cores and crowns, were completed before the remainder of phase three. Um, here's the before and after. Here's the mandible before and after. So here's the final process review. The final process review is completed when all of phase three treatment has been completed at, at the final process review, the details and plan of action in terms of which materials are gonna be used and whatever prosthetics for each particular case and each particular tooth is also determined. One of our patient's biggest concerns is aesthetics and our patient has used various forms of whitening products and treatment and whitening treatments throughout the majority of her life, which made shade matching somewhat complicated. Um, after assessing the patient's age, overall occlusion, and facial anatomy, we uh, relied then relied on our patient's overall desired outcome for her treatment and decided that using Emax for her final restorations was appropriate. So we did a little bit of research on the 10-year survival of press, acid-etched, Emax, lithium bisilicate, monolithic and bilayered complete cover restorations, uh, performance and outcomes as a function of both tooth position and age. The objective was to examine the 10-year survival of press, lithium bisilicate, glass, ceramic restorations, and the relationship between clinical parameters and the outcomes. The conclusion was that press, lithium bisilicate restorations in the study survived successfully over the 10.4 year period study with an overall failure rate of below 0.2% per year and were primarily confined to molar teeth. And the risk of failure at any age was minimal for both men and women. And now we're ready for phase four. And so here is the picture in your report of the crown prep on number three and the onlay prep on number two. And then those preps were done at the innovation center and we use an intraoral scan and the CERAC machine to mill out the prosthetics, but we took a final impression just in case, just because as a precautionary thing, we didn't really know how the, the restorations were gonna turn out. And if we needed to use a, a, a conventional impression, then we would already have it. So here is a picture of the seating of the onlay and the crown before, and then here is a picture of the final cementation of the crown, of the crown and the onlay. And then here's the final uh, crown and onlay cemented in the mouth. And then here are the crown preps on number 18 and number 19. And this was actually the conclusion of her treatment so far. These were done about a week ago because she just hasn't really had all that much time to come into, into the clinic and get treatment because of her work schedule. And she's going to elect to continue her treatment in the graduate prosthodontics clinic. Um, However, regarding the uh, already prepped number 18 and 19, the faculty and I determined that at appointment, we place a patient in temporaries and cement them with permanent cement instead of temporary cement to ensure that our, our marginal seals are good and, and the restorations last until she can be seen again. And then our pearl of wisdom is to never half-ass two things, to whole-ass one thing. Here are our references. And any questions or concerns? Let's take that as a no.
incentivize them. Good to go. All right. Can you guys hear me in the back? Good. Maybe not. All right. Cool. All righty. So my name is Mason Bishop, and this is my colleague, Keith Pickman. And this is our case presentation titled Bridges, Bridges Everywhere. So it's worth noting now that this title kind of reflects how we felt when we were initially assigned the patient. It kind of looked like the patient was going to be interested in doing two or three uh, FPDs, which was obviously pretty exciting because we could have used the fixed credit. Um, but unfortunately, after speaking with the patient, it was apparent that this wasn't really the case. Um, so we'll get into it. So for our patient's social history, she was. She is a 57-year-old female from Fayette, Pennsylvania. She has three cats and a dog and enjoys spending time with her mother and watching Marvel movies. As for her medical history, she has an average blood pressure of 128 over 82, uh, takes Benadryl for uh, seasonal allergies as needed, and she has allergies to penicillin and Novocaine. Turns out she actually, she felt that her, uh, her allergy to Novocaine was related to the epinephrine, uh, but this is actually a, a common theme and we'll discuss it a little bit more later. Um, additionally, the patient reported that she quit smoking four years ago and now vapes, and so we classified her as an ASA too. Um, so as providers here at the school, obviously we've been well educated regarding the uncertainty and safety of vaping and its use as an alternative to smoking. But it's important to note that many patients aren't really aware of this, and um, our patient was definitely one of them. She essentially thought that she was successfully using a replacement for the nicotine in uh, cigarettes without the many known chemicals that are known to be in conventional cigarettes. Um, and because of this, we looked at the literature to kind of su substantiate what we were telling her and uh, so that she could kind of see our reason for suggesting her to stop. So um, until recently, this topic really wasn't that well researched um, in the literature. So this is actually a review titled A Decade of E-Cigarettes, Limited Research and Unresolved Safety Concerns. Um, so studies within this review showed that 90 to 95% of adult subjects interviewed felt that e-cigarettes were significantly cleaner and healthy, or healthier than smoking. Um, and it also notes that in 2014, there were over 466 brands and over 7,000 flavors. Um, so why that's pertinent, um, obviously, between all of those, they can have different contents, um, and they're not really required to say what is in them, so that's kind of concerning. Um, and when examined chemically, some of the e-liquids and vapors, uh, between all of them, were known to contain at least 20 known carcinogens, so an obvious concern there. And additionally of concern is that, um, so the way that they're marketed is some of them have varying amounts of uh, nicotine in them. and um, the amount that was marketed or advertised didn't always match up with um, what was actually present in the, um, the product. And so even some of those that were marketed as having no nicotine in them um, did actually have some. So 
obvious concern there as well. But thankfully our patient became um, a little more receptive to us suggesting other replacement therapies um, as per um, obviously this research and what we've been taught. And so suggesting uh, or uh, this is also in agreement with the American College of Cardiology and what they suggest in their recent guidelines that they've recently pub published. So obviously this research substantiates that as well as those guidelines. So for our patient's chief complaint, it was I went to fix my mouth, but I went to Aspen Dental for an abscess and found out it would cost $12,000. I cannot afford that, so I came here. So essentially she was aware that there were some areas that needed to be addressed. Uh, she had one tooth which had recently been bothering her, and you'll see in a second that this was number 28. Uh, she also recently had a bridge debond, and so she wanted to address that as well. As for the patient's dental history, uh, she did report that she would like to change the appearance of her teeth um, and that it would upset her to lose her teeth and wear dentures, but it turns out that this was more so her anterior dentition, as you'll see in a little bit. As for her previous dental treatments, you can see um, FPD is noted there, and we're going to talk about that here in a second. Um, as for current problems, uh, dry mouth, and that could be associated with of aging, and also food catching between her teeth, which will make a little more sense here in a sec. As for oral habits, um, she did report flossing daily, um, but however, not brushing every day, so that's something obviously we hit on early and got her motivated to do. Um, as for her TMD evaluation, everything was within normal limits. For the cures risk assessment, um, she did have more disease indicators than protective factors, and you can see in there, uh, visible cavities penetrating to the dentin, multi-surface restorations, and uh, exposed roots. Her protective factors included that she lives in a fluoridated community. She did have adequate saliva flow, um, but because she had more indi disease indicators than protective factors, we did classify her as high. And to increase her uh, fluoride exposure, we, provide her, we provided her with a Prevident and obviously this was due to um, decay that's present currently, her being classified as high risk, and then also the number of restorations that she had present when she presented to us. As for the patient's orofacial examination, um, gingival inflammation was present generally and uh, it was moderate, uh, as well as plaque was moderate as well. As for the teeth, there was some extrinsic staining, crowding of the maxillary anterior, and fracture of the porcelain on the buckle of number five. And here you can see our patient's initial uh, presentation. Uh, so from the facial view, the um, patient had a six unit bridge spanning from number 22 to 27 um, with no problems at this time, though you can see some discoloration there around the margins, um, but everything was solid, there was no concerns. Areas of concern are surfered in red, so there's spatial decay present on number six and number 11, decay along the incisal edge adjacent to a composite on number nine, and also the remaining root of number 12, um, which will show up a little better in the occlusal view. On the mandibular left, you can also see where the FPD debonded, and on the mandibular right, uh, number 28 has mesial decay, which will also show up a little better in the occlusal view. So, as for the occlusal views, uh, again, you can see the remaining root tip of number 12 and also carries on number seven and 10. Um, also, you can see number 20 that was previously prepped and number 28, which has mesiofacial caries. Um, and that's the tooth that was mentioned in her chief complaint. Also, it's somewhat difficult to tell from this image, but there's also a fracture of the mesial marginal ridge on number 29. Um, and additionally, in this image of the maxillary arch, you can see that endo accesses were completed through the FPD on number three and number five. Um, you can see it appears that the access on number three was filled with composite, while the material that was used on the occlusal of number five had debonded. Um, though the canal was sealed, so this wasn't really an immediate concern for us. So here are our patient's initial radiographs. These were taken before she was assigned to us. Um, unfortunately, the mesial of number five can't really be viewed in either image. Um, but this area was evaluated clinically and additional radiographs were taken at a later date to confirm a sound margin. Um, you can also see some radiographic calculus uh, present circled in yellow. And again, you can see extensive decay on number 28, mesial approximating the pulp. Um, also on the mesial buccal root of number three, you can see some widening of the TBL there it appears and we'll discuss that a little more when we get to the consults. As for the patient's left side, um, you can see the root tip on number 12 again, as well as where the patient's FPD had debonded on the mandibular left, uh, which was 
probably related to some less than ideal crown preps there that were completed prior to her becoming a patient here. Um, also, you can see a periapical radiolucency around the mesobuccal root of number 14. And this is the, our patient's pano. She actually had a pano from Aspen when she originally presented to us. So this was taken after her treatment had started due to an oral path consult. Um, so on this pan, you can see most areas are within normal limits, but you can see some pneumatization of the right maxillary sinus. And you can see what appears to maybe be some areas of idiopathic osteosclerosis distal to the apex of number 29. And here's our patient's initial maxillary period chart. You can see fours indicated by the yellow arrows and a five indicated with the red arrow there. And for our patient's initial mandibular period chart, you can see two fours indicated with the yellow arrows. And for treatment planning consults, the uh, perio, the etiology was plaque and calculus. Symptoms were bleeding on probing and inflammation. The diagnosis was generalized mild chronic periodontitis and the prognosis was favorable with scaling and root planning uh, one to three teeth of the upper right quadrant. As for operative, the problem was decay on number six, um, number six facial, number seven lingual, number nine incisal, 10 lingual, and 11 facial. And number 29 also has a fracture on the mesial marginal ridge. Um, the diagnosis was the same, and the prognosis was favorable with the removal of caries and placement of permanent restorations. For endo, there, the problem was a history of lingering pain to cold with uh, number 28, which was endo tested. Uh, number three and number 14 had apical changes associated with the mesiobuccal root, as noted previously. And number 18 and 20 had a history of caries and loss of uh, the FTD there. The diagnosis for number three and number 14 was asymptomatic apical periodontitis. For number 18 and 20 was asymptomatic irreversible pulpitis. And number 28 was symptomatic irreversible pulpitis. Prognosis was fair following root canal treatment of number 28 and retreatment of number three and number 14. And also you can see their intentional root canal treatment was suggested for number 18 and 20 prior to PROS. So for those of you that don't know, because we ourselves weren't initially aware of what it was, uh, an intentional root canal is kind of treating the teeth preemptively. So you're treating, uh, you're endo treating the teeth prior to doing a PROS work because you might be expecting some endo concerns uh, down the road or sensitivity. Um, and so, also of note, uh, number 18 and 20, the patient actually elected to select a treatment plan that would eliminate the need to um, treat those teeth. Uh, so following this consult, this information was presented and explained to the patient. At this time, she stated she did not wish to have the retreatment of number three and number 14, even after explaining the potential risks of no treatment. Um, so she did understand that she'd be assuming the risk of um, not having the treatment, and obviously she was advised to do so. But um, because she opted not to have this treatment, we suggested that she monitor those areas closely, um, and we're planning, planning to monitor, uh, monitor them as well. And so they weren't included in any, any of her treatment planning options. As for oral surgery, the problem was non-restorable number 12 and questionably restorable number 18 and 20. The diagnosis was the same, and the prognosis was favorable with extraction of number 18, uh, 12, and 20. For fix, the problem was that retainers of FTD number three and five, as well as the crown on number 14, had endo accesses through the crowns, as previously shown. Um, however, these accesses were adequately sealed, and the patient elects no replacement of these restorations at this time. However, number 28 will need full uh, coverage after root canal treatment and the diagnosis was the same. Uh, prognosis was fair with placement of full coverage restoration on number 28 following root canal treatment. For the removable consult, the um, problem was partially edentulous mandible. The diagnosis was a Kennedy class one mandibular arch. That would be following the extraction of number 18 and 20. Uh, the prognosis was fair with fabrication of mandibular RPD to improve function and provide posterior support. And you can see our uh, test from the preliminary process review there. Uh, as for the design, we suggested a lingual plate major connector, RPA on number 21 for the distal extension, rot wire on number 29 for the distal extension there, and an MO rest on the survey crown on number 28. And for the last of the consults, uh, oral path. So the problem was a focal area of low bone density distal to number 18. 
um, and it was asymptomatic. The diagnosis was a focal osteoporotic marrow defect, but the oral pathologist did suggest um, going ahead and doing a biopsy of this area. Um, so we did get her scheduled with oral surgery. The oral surgery faculty uh, clinically evaluated her and also suggested taking a pant. Um, and it was just because of the pant and his clinical findings, he actually opted not to, not to do the biopsy at this time and monitor that as well. Um, and so really there was no treatment required for that area. Um, now I'm gonna pass it over to Keith to get into the treatment planning options. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. So for treatment option number one, um, phase one and phase two had no treatment. Uh, phase three, SRP, one to three teeth in the upper right and upper left. Oral hygiene instructions, uh, bicuspid root canal therapy on tooth number 28, uh, composite core number 28, extraction of number 12, 18, and 20, a one surface anterior restoration on number six, seven, nine, 10, and 11, three surface amalgam on number 29, uh, period reevaluation, fluoride varnish, and then in phase four, PFM crown for number 28 and a mandibular RPD. And then in maintenance, total cost for treatment option number one was $2,287. For treatment option number two, um, pretty much the same as treatment option number one, uh, main differences being um, molar root canal therapy for number 18, which would be a resident case, um, bicuspid root canal therapy for number 20, in addition to number 28, um, composite cores on number 18, 20, and 28, and then only extracting number 12. Um, in phase four, uh, we would do an FPD abutment uh, on number 18 and 20, and then a plonic to replace number 19. A uh, total cost for treatment option number two was $4,764. And then of course, uh, treatment option number three is no treatment. So our patient chose treatment option number one. So our first appointment was after the treatment plan was to be extractions, uh, number 12, 18, and 20. And it was at this first appointment that something happened that really altered the rest of our patient's treatment. We encountered some complications. Um, while attempting to extract number 20, our patient started to complain of feeling sweaty lightheaded and as she described it, floaty. So we immediately stopped our treatment, um, placed a cold paper towel over her head, um, tried to cool her down. We hooked her up to the oxygen mask and the monitors and oral surgery. And it was at this time that we learned our patient's blood pressure had dropped to about 80 over 46. So that was pretty concerning. Um, so we waited several minutes, um, monitoring her status with the oral surgery residents there and eventually her blood pressure returned to more normal range at 118 over 77. Um, she was feeling a lot better, so both the patient and the providers, we agreed to continue with the extractions, and we extracted tooth number 20 with no complications. Um, however, while attempting to extract tooth number 18, um, same symptoms came up. So again, we halted treatment, um, same thing, and at this time the patient's blood pressure had dropped to 94 over 58. So again, we waited several minutes for blood pressure to return to normal. Uh, once it had, um, patient and the providers, we both agreed to extract number 18 as it was mobile, but to wait until a different day to extract tooth number 12. So this led us to think, you know, what exactly had happened here. We, uh, we talked with our patient and uh, tried to figure out some, th some things from her. And she told us, um, one that she hadn't eaten since the previous night and the appointment was at 1 p.m. She also hadn't slept very well the previous night. And she also mentioned she had never really freaked out or had any uh, issues with dental anxiety. So we advised her to consult with her primary care physician. And in the meantime, we considered uh, three possibilities ourselves for what might've happened. One being uh, hypoglycemia, um, as mentioned, she hadn't eaten and potentially showing some signs of mental confusion. Two, uh, vasodepressor syncope. Um, she had some predisposing factors and she didn't lose consciousness, but it might've been that she was just in the prodromal stage of that. 
And then third, we considered that maybe she actually had a reaction to the local anesthetic. Uh, if you will recall, she reported an allergy to Novocaine and she did show some signs of type one hypersensitivity, but no typical like uh, difficulty breathing or anything. Um, so even so, we considered the potential for the reaction to local anesthetic uh, intriguing and we wanted to investigate the topic. So we found an article, um, it uh, researched uh, two different cases in which the patients had a uh, different reaction to lidocaine during the course of their dental treatment. Uh, one being a 54 year old female um, who experienced uh, cloudy, cloudiness of consciousness, chills during her dental treatment. And then a 41 year old female who um, had symptoms of dizziness and systemic urticaria or hives during her treatment. Um, after out, both patients were referred for allergy testing and the first patient was diagnosed with bupivacaine intolerance, um, which is basically the appearance of adverse effects even with a small amount of the medication. And then the second patient was actually diagnosed with uh, lidocaine allergy. So to get into the discussion conclusion of what the authors did, um, what they found was that adverse effects to local anesthetics are pretty rare in the literature, but they do occur. Um, there's generally two types, the type one, which is the immediate uh, commonly anaphylactic reaction or the type four delayed type. Uh, the reactions typically occur with the ester local anesthetics due to the PABA metabolite. Um, the skin prick test is usually the most universally accepted method for detecting allergies. And it's also important to differentiate an adverse effect versus an actual allergy. An adverse effect being um, intravascular injection of the local anesthetic or a reaction to the epinephrine in the local anesthetic. So after we did our research and we consulted with uh, Dr. Manji as well about our patient, um, we didn't actually believe that our patient had a true allergic reaction to the local anesthetic. Um, we believed it was probably either the hypoglycemia or the syncope. However, um, our patient and her physician felt pretty strongly that it was an allergic reaction. And the only way to be certain was through an allergy test, which the patient didn't really want to go through at this time. So we decided to use uh, Mavivacaine for our, the rest of our patient's treatment. The reason we chose Mavivacaine was because, um, as Mason mentioned earlier, patient reported her allergy was to the epinephrine, not necessarily the local anesthetic itself. Uh, most likely she was not referring to the epinephrine and most likely referring to the metabisulfite antioxidant. And so the last of, lack of a vasoconstrictor made it inconvenient for our treatment, but the patient knowing that she wasn't gonna have a reaction like she did before made her feel a lot more at ease during the treatment. So we continued on with our treatment and extracted tooth number 12 using mavivacaine with uh, no complications. And so next step was planned to be uh, scaling and root planing. Uh, however, tooth number 28 uh, that was planned for root canal therapy started bothering our patient. So we began our root canal therapy. Um, we accessed and cleaned and shaped and filled with uh, calcium hydroxide. And then we completed our scaling and root planing before our final operation. Uh, here you can see three periapical radiographs. The one on the left depicting our file shot, our working length at 23 millimeters, which we confirmed with an apex locator. The middle showing our cone shot with our gutta percha seated to our working length. And then a shot after we uh, finish obturation. Our master apical file was size 35, so we chose a corresponding gutta percha cone for obturation. Uh, here is our patient's uh, maxillary perio chart after we did our scaling and root planning at the reeval. Um, you will note how some pockets uh, actually worsened, particularly around the uh, buccolingual and distolingual at number five. Uh, we believe this was most likely from improperly angulate, improper angulation of our perio probe at the initial appointment. And then here is our patient's mandibular period chart. Uh, you can note uh, by the green arrows, the decrease in the pockets on the mesiofacial of number uh, 22 and the distolingual number 27. Um, at this appointment, we recommended to our patient to invest in an electric toothbrush. And we also instructed her on using floss fetters and super floss to help her clean underneath her FBDs. So after our re-eval um, and discovering that there was a seven milliliter pocket on number five, um, we obtained a new periodontal consult. Uh, the diagnosis being 
pretty much the same except for localized severe chronic periodontitis on tooth number five. And it was recommended to have a periodontal surgery to fix this seven millimeter pocket. Uh, however, a patient declined the surgical treatment option at this time, even after we explained the risk of no treatment. And so after our reeval, we began working on our patient's restorations, and we started with the composite core on tooth number 28. And here you can see our patient's pictures. Um, we, the conclusion of all uh, phase three treatment. Um, note how we completed all the remaining restorations. Um, everything's looking a lot healthier. Next was our final process review. Um, our original design for mandibular RPD remained unchanged, so we were able to begin phase four treatment pretty quickly. We started phase four uh, by prepping tooth number 28 for a survey crown, and here you can see a photo showing our final impression. And here you can see pictures uh, after we poured up our impression uh, showing the die. Um, it is unmounted on the left side and mounted on the right and ready to be sent out to the lab. And here you can see the bite wing uh, after we had the PFM survey crown for insertion. Um, you can also note by the red circle, the calculus still on the distal number five indicated by the red circle. Um, so this was pretty concerning. We thought we had removed this at the reevaluation appointment. Um, so we anesthetized our patients and again, attempted to remove the calculus. Uh, here you can see rest seat preps that we cut according to our design cast. And after cutting the rest seat preps, we took a framework compression. Uh, you also note how our patient has bilateral distal extensions. So due to this, after doing our framework try-in, uh, we worked with Roger to help fabricate a custom tray for an altered cast impression. And here you can see our altered cast um, showing our rest seat preps and the survey count with the MRS on number 28. And here are pictures of our patient after we inserted her mandibular RPD. I uh, only had to make a few minor adjustments, uh, tightening the clasp around number 21 and 29 and adjusting the occlusion, occlusion slightly. Our patient was very happy to have posterior teeth that would allow her to chew more efficiently. And here is an occlusal view uh, of the RPD after insertion, kind of more clearly shows our framework uh, since we didn't get pictures during the try-in. So overall, this was a really great learning experience treating this patient, um, not just in the procedures that we did, but some of the things that we didn't do and you know, the situation we encountered. Um, if we could go back, um, there's a couple things we would have done differently. Uh, one, we would have offered our patient a bone graft after attracting tooth number 12. Um, our patient would nev was never really certain that she wanted to replace tooth number 12 and if she wanted to get an implant, but to at least offer, that as, offer her that as a treatment option, uh, I think we could have done that. Um, we also would have inquired further into her allergy to Novocaine and really would have recommended her to have allergy testing, um, especially um, after using Mepivacaine, it is, uh, does not last very long and it's pretty challenging to try to complete a root canal therapy procedure using just Mepivacaine, no uh, vasoconstrictor. And then finally, we would uh, further discuss treatment options for the FPD on number three through five. Um, as was mentioned, the canal was sealed on number five, but um, to just offer options, whether that was whether she wanted to replace it or just fill the access hole. Um, and even knowing what we could have done better, uh, we still feel we did a pretty good service for our patient, always tried to keep her best interests throughout the course of treatment. Um, especially, you know, we really tried to focus on hygiene, uh, giving her a powered toothbrush and the additional hygiene or, uh, under her FPD piece. And throughout the course of treatment, we felt that she became to trust us and is more open to um, quitting her electronic cigarette use and consider uh, FDA approved nicotine replacement therapy uh, to help her with her uh, smoking habit. Our pearl of wisdom is that we are not beginners forever, but we never stop learning. Here are our references, any questions?
quite sure how I'm going to post these. So we find out how they're recorded. So let's go in and just um, get There you are. Thank you very much. Welcome. These yeah, are your it. keys. Okay. It looks like an IT connects piece. Anybody leave keys? Any of the presenters? The IT guy. Yeah, I mean, this looked like somebody who's definitely an employee of somebody. I'll, okay, I'll go down and see if he's still here. Okay, very good. Thank you.